Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Abby Gilbert with Humana, and I am so excited today to be with some of my favorite colleagues and partners um, to talk about outcomes-based financing and the implications that that has on some of the programs that we're trying to do today. So Robert, let's start with you. I would love it to first start with you telling us a little bit about the transformation that VOA has gone through from really seeing itself as you know, a CBO, as charity, as philanthropy, to truly being, um, you know, a community health provider. Yeah, we, we do believe that that transformation and that, that pivot is so important to, to both our future as an organization, but also just thinking about the system transformation that we believe needs to take place. And really that idea of ensuring that we've got that integration between health, housing, and human services. Uh, which we've really been providing as an organization for over 125 years, but we always haven't thought about ourselves in terms of that integrated fashion. We've quite often thought about uh, those services into particular silos as either a charity or a human services organization or a housing organization or some of our clinical services within that silo. So I think we really have a unique opportunity to finally kind of break down some of those uh, barriers that have been there for so long in terms of how about how community-based organizations like VOA think about themselves, but then how the system kind of treats organizations like Volunteers of America. Some of the things that um, kind of drive me on a day-to-day -day basis about this transformation is, is one, uh, the amount of need within communities right now has just been increasing year over year. Uh, and especially through the pandemic, those needs have increased significantly across every single community that we serve. So the needs have increased. The other thing that drives me for transformation is, is frankly, the, the workforce uh, and being able to find that uh, kind of workforce now and that workforce of the future uh, that's going to be able to deliver both in-person and hybrid services. We need to kind of reform the overall system to provide the resources that are necessary so that we ensure that community-based organizations like Volunteers of America uh, have the resources to pay a living wage to the workforce now and in the future and really deliver those uh, kind of high impact services. So Robert, just to build on that, I know where you sit at the national organization, you guys are doing a lot of support to those local affiliates that are actually providing the services. Right. Um, I know you can't speak for them, but it, you know, if you had to guess, like, what is the, the biggest challenge that you think that they face in thinking about these strategies differently? So is there, is there one thing? Is it a couple things? Um, I just think that would be interesting to talk about for a minute. Yeah, I would say there are several barriers. Uh, I would just kind of reinforce that idea that the thing that keeps uh, our organization awake at night and our, our CEOs across the organization awake at night is going to be workforce. Uh, in ensuring that they've got the workforce to deliver services to some of those with the greatest needs uh, within our, our communities. Um, and so that is you know, issue number one for them right now. Uh, I would also say the other thing that um, kind of drives them on a day-to-day -day basis is that increase in community needs that they're seeing uh, and feeling like we've still got silos uh, that provide barriers to them uh, being able to provide the services, uh, quite often evidence-based services that they know are successful in, in making change and moving impact locally. Uh, but again, they don't quite know how to navigate uh, that the healthcare system as well as the, the policy mm -hmm. system. Uh, and so quite often those, those are the barriers that really uh, kind of result in them not being able to kind of mm -hmm. move forward services the way they would like. Okay. And Allison, with that context about the transformation that VOA made, talk to me a little bit about why you think that outcomes-based financing and impact capital is, is going to be helpful when we think about this, these problems. What, when we say outcomes-based financing, what does that actually mean? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, essentially, it means paying for the things that we as a society value. Um, and what we have uh, right now is a system where sometimes just due to inertia, sometimes because we actively impede mm -hmm. <laughs> progress toward paying for the things we want, uh, we don't actually see our dollars flowing to the places that uh, will actually produce the results that we all want and value mm -hmm. um, and need to see. Um, and you know, I characterize so much of 
what we do in relation to Robert's role is really helping to solve for the tragedy of the commons. So Robert's organization uh, sort of individually and collectively produces so much good for the people they serve and so many other parties benefit tremendously from the work they do. But right now they don't actually pay for that. They are not assigning a price to the value they get. And I'm not suggesting that every single human who lives within you know, mm -hmm. a mile of a VOA facility right. somehow right. contributes, but there are organizations that um, get tremendous value from the good work that, um, that those affiliates produce. So what we try to do is monetize that and figure out financing structures that enable there to be a meaningful and sustained business relationship so that those affiliates don't rely purely on grant funding or purely on sort of um, below market value contracts that they may have through various relationships, that they actually have the resourcing they need to not only survive, but to thrive and meet the demand that is increasingly at their doorsteps. Right. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this more a little bit later, but just in the context of, of what you shared, tell me a little bit about how the the health plans, right, interact in that particular scenario that you just talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, you know, health plans have members and very often those members have needs that um, are not met through traditional clinical medical services. They might have issues related to housing, um, hunger, as you mentioned. Um, and so it's important when we think about individuals as their holistic selves that we find opportunities to tend to those needs. Um, but there's no mechanism in healthcare <laughs> to actually pay for those types of services. So what we do is identify what are the things that you're doing as a VOA that actually do map to traditional healthcare services or for which you can get a reimbursable claim and which are the ones that aren't? And is there a way through creative financing and unique structures that we can actually fill that gap and give you enough resourcing um, that you can make a program work and viable without having to, you know, sort of always be wondering whether you're making payroll mm -hmm. <laughs> at the end of the mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah. So, um, Robert, this next question is going to be for you, and I know we've talked about this a lot, but just to, to flush it out, when I think about the role that um, Humana and other health plans are playing as far as identifying um, the need, health-related social needs within mm -hmm. our members, um, we are using predictive models, we are screening, right, for, for and asking questions that we maybe wouldn't have asked in the past. And with all of that great work is, um, an opportunity, right, for us to identify all of this need, but now we have to um, better connect those members with resources in the community. And, you know, you guys have been around for a long time, you're providing services already, but let's talk a little bit about um, the need to then increase capacity and scaling. So when we think about, um, you know, your all's need to continue to grow and scale these services, how do these you know, concepts play together and, and maybe talk to us a little bit about why that's um, why that's exciting and you think that it can really help you guys scale. Yeah, I mean, I think the concepts do really play together. And I, I think the only way that we are going to kind of increase services that are going to kind of fit that increased community need are indeed through some of these value-based arrangements in understanding that there's tremendous opportunity within the system to provide for better outcomes and and, and better cost solutions as well. So, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about the relationship with Humana is, is first of all, the shared mission. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we are focused on providing <clears throat> services for, again, healthy individuals and healthy communities. And we've felt that uh, from day one uh, of the relationship with Humana. And I think that's why kind of we value the, the partnership so much. I think as you talked about data and understanding needs, as a community-based organization, we feel those kind of in the community on a day-to-day -day basis. And we really like to think that one of our greatest kind of values is this idea of being in community, uh, actually touching the people that uh, are the members and need the services, quite often those with some of the, the greatest needs in the community. So we feel that on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't always have the data 
uh, available to help uh, kind of design where that next need is going to be or where there's opportunity that's potentially being missed within the overall system. And I think that's, for example, where kind of Humana has a really important role to play in partnership with community-based organizations is to bring that data to the table, uh, not only to, to drive uh, the opportunities to, to meet needs, but around issues like equity as well, uh, and really identify where there is a gap in terms of equity, there is a gap in terms of, of access, for example. Um, so I think there's so much more to come in terms of our relationship and partnership. I think one of the real challenges we have as a community-based organization uh, in having access to kind of those, those data flows and, and technology, et cetera, is certainly gonna be a, a need for upfront capital. Um, that we really stretch every single one of our dollars uh, in a very long way to, to meet, again, the needs of the community, so the services we're providing, but every single one of those dollars also gets devoted to, to staff and trying to pay a fair and living wage. So I really think there's, uh, again, kind of this opportunity to bring more capital into this relationship that we're talking about through these value-based arrangements uh, that are going to allow us to invest in additional capacity as a community-based organization. But first, we got to kind of think differently about the, the system and our role in the system. Absolutely. So <clears throat> to kind of bring some of these conversations to light, I think we're working on several different programs together. But for our conversation today, I really want to focus on family-focused recovery. And, you know, obviously at Humana, we um, saw that as a need and an area that we were obviously committed to. But let's really just dive into why this type of financing and this type of investment works. And so before we do that, Robert, do you mind to just share a little bit, tell us what Family Focused Recovery is and, and just share more with that, about that program. Sure, and uh, anytime we get a chance to talk about Family Focused Recovery, we do, because it's a, a service that we're so excited about. Uh, so Family Focused Recovery is a, a service that we provide for uh, pregnant and parenting women uh, who have substance use disorder uh, along with their, their children. Uh, the service is really focused on, at the end of the day, you know, healthy babies, healthy families, uh, healthy moms. We've been providing the service for over 46 years uh, in several communities, uh, but we really have an opportunity in partnership with Humana and Quantified Ventures uh, to really kind of elevate and, and scale that uh, that service to more communities. Okay, and so help everyone understand, just to dive in a little bit more, because I know there are multiple parts of that, but maybe speak a little bit more to the residential component of sure. like what that actually looks like for some of those moms and families, because I think it's important when we think about the expense behind some of these programs, right. um, that's that will maybe help everyone kind of connect more with that. So maybe just talk a little bit about more um, what do those programs look like on a sure. daily basis, and especially that, again, residential component? Well, yeah, well, so family-focused recovery, you know, when I think about it, is, is absolutely kind of ripe, as I would say, for a value-based uh, approach. <laughs> First of all, you do have an, a pretty intensive residential component uh, where we ensure that um, not only does the mom uh, come to gain support, but typically the mom's got you know, kids as well, and that we've got an environment where the mom can get healthy and that we don't have to kind of tear apart the family to do that. We can actually have her come with her mm -hmm. children uh, to that uh, kind of residential based service and get, you know, uh, just great services with a lot of, of peer support, uh, a lot of intensive clinical services as well. So kind of a whole suite of intensive residential uh, services. Um, I would, one of the things, you know, that's really needed when you've got a, a intensive residential service uh, is going to, to be the need for upfront capital mm -hmm. uh, for both the investment in the particular home or facility that you're going to place that residential services, uh, as well as uh, for the initial kind of startup mm -hmm. uh, of a service opportunity like that. It's, it's intensive to bring on uh, clinical staff to meet all the requirements, the regulations, um, to really get that uh, referral stream uh, moving. So that that takes initial investment in, in time and, and money. 
And that's one of the reasons why kind of a value-based uh, approach and providing a, an initial capital infusion uh, is really important mm -hmm. if we're going to, to scale that service opportunity. So Allison, I know this is one of your favorite things to talk about. So, um, and you and I have the pleasure of understanding these programs just as, as well as Robert does. So um, let's dive in a little bit to how those programs are paid for now. And let's talk a little bit also about the role that managed care can play in, in kind of making that equation that Robert mm -hmm. just talked about whole. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the reality is that uh, right now they're paid in different ways in different states, depending right. on right. where they're located. And that's partially because different state agencies have um, different responsibilities and different grant uh, and contracting mechanisms. So um, it's partially challenging just to sort of think about scale in that context, because no matter where you go, you have to sort of define yourself relative to the payment streams that exist. Um, putting that to the side, none of the existing payment streams are actually sufficient to cover the cost of the program. Um, so that introduces sort of another level uh, barrier uh, to sort of building it from scratch somewhere or even expanding it where you know it's needed further. Um, and so what we do is try to maximize and take full advantage of existing reimbursement streams. So in Medicaid, that means that we look at all the services for which you could you know, bill a claim, um, and we try to create a financing model that allows us to take advantage of those. Uh, but then we, you know, going back to defining that gap, we sort of look at what value is produced through the program, what types of outcomes are these moms and their children experiencing, and how can we assign a value to, to those experiences that are meaningful to the health plan partners and likely others in the community, um, particularly the state. Uh, so it ends up being really a win-win strategy. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about how you see, so not just Humana, but how do the MCOs play in this and why is it important um, that all the MCOs play in this, right? Not yeah. just Humana. No, absolutely. Um, so that, you know, initial capitalization is critically important and it is um, historically been a barrier to starting something. But another barrier is just the ongoing operating expenses. If those are greater than the revenue coming in to pay for it, then there's not a whole lot of incentive for these CEOs uh, to actually launch something. Um, and so it is then important to look at who are the actors in a market who could help be part of that sustainability solution. Um, and we see a tremendous opportunity for managed Medicaid plans here. Um, you know, usually there's anywhere from three to six different plans that exist in a market. Um, you couldn't make a viable VOA, family-focused recovery right. facility, if only one of those plans were to participate in a value-based contracting relationship. Um, so what the work that, that we're doing is trying to engage as many as possible in um, having those sustainable business relationships with those affiliates that creates that virtuous revenue model cycle and allows for the VOA um, affiliates to operate the FFR program at a level that is optimized to achieve the outcomes that everybody right. wants to see. Right. Um, and that, you know, further, it, it, it is, it kicks off this flywheel that's really a virtuous cycle because having identified um, what an evidence-based program can do and seeing what it produces in terms of impact, that creates a ripple effect so other actors, whether it be in other markets or even um, you know, agencies within states, they can see the benefits and maybe, maybe start to reconsider some of the policies and the levers that they have at their disposal as well. So <clears throat> you teed me up perfectly. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so this question is really for both of you. So I'm going to put it out there and then you can decide who chimes in first. But let's talk about health policy um, and advocacy relating to these subjects. And I think, Allison, um, you know, you, you touched on that a little bit. But I think there are so many broader kind of implications and things to touch on. And so when we, when we think about that, what is the first thing that kind of comes to your mind as to why why this is such an important um, 
part of it. Are we gonna arm wrestle for like who <laughs> takes that next or? Yeah, no, I mean, I think Allison, you know, touched on it. Um, in every different market, uh, there is a, a slightly different uh, kind of set of puzzle pieces mm -hmm. that as a provider, we have to put together uh, to provide what we know is ultimately kind of the best care and is going to produce the, the best outcomes. Uh, putting together those puzzle pieces uh, certainly comes at a, a cost. It comes at a cost to us as a provider organization. It comes as, at a cost to the managed care organization and to the overall system. Um, so one of the things we simply need to do is take some of that inefficiency out of the system because we, we know it can then lead to, to better solutions ultimately. The other thing I would say is that kind of patchwork of, of puzzle pieces, if I'm mixing metaphors here, uh, is, is the idea that it, it does create uh, barriers to care ultimately. Uh, as Allison said, sometimes uh, some of those policies can limit the number of, of days in a mm -hmm. residential setting, can limit the number of days in terms of community-based supports that are provided uh, after a mom leaves the residential settings. Uh, we're driven by the evidence and what tells us provides the best outcomes, again, for, for the babies, for moms, mm -hmm. and the overall family. Uh, and where we've got uh, kind of barriers from a policy standpoint um, to achieving those, those outcomes that, again, we know are going to provide the best outcomes and the best cost for the system, I think that's where we collectively have to kind of come together uh, and advocate for kind of a more efficient set of, uh, of supports and policies. Yeah, and, and Allison, you might have been getting ready to touch on this, but when I think too, it's not just the complexity of even one particular state agency, right, with Medicaid. Um, we're talking about child welfare. We could be talking right, about in right. some states a separate foster care system and what are the, the policies around, um, you know, women feeling comfortable coming forward and saying, I have you know, an issue with substance use right. and I need help, but I'm scared that I'm gonna lose my children. So it's just, it's been interesting to me that it's so much, um, there's opportunity not just in how we think about interacting with Medicaid programs, yeah. but kind of across the state in, in multiple different silos. So I don't know, Allison, from your perspective, when we think about policy and advocacy, we're primarily talking about some this payment piece of it, but you know, I just wonder from your perspective, you know, is, is that the, the most important thing first? Is there some of these other things that Robert talked about? Um, I just, I'd love to hear your perspective. Um, so I love the metaphor and what immediately jumped to mind is like, if I'm gonna solve a puzzle, I want it to be one of those super basic ones that you give right. like a 18 month old <laughs> and not like some three dimensional Lego right. thing. 2000 that, piece right, puzzle. exactly, yeah, yeah. that my sister <laughs> likes to do. So, um, you know, I think that being said, uh, there are so many ways to tackle this. I think you're absolutely right, Abby, right? Like all of the issue areas we work on at their core touch almost every single policy issue. I mean, there's touches the criminal justice side, mm -hmm. like really um, th there's not a sector housing that isn't sort of implicated in these areas mm -hmm. where we work. Um, I think we focus on financing because of the catalytic effect it can have, right? So um, it's, and it's a little bit just our, our sort of um, bias for action and quite honestly, a little bit of impatience mm -hmm. uh, because there are a lot of really smart people working to move policy at the state, the federal level, um, where we feel like we can add the most value and contribute the most is just try to, help people figure out that if they just make a few minor adjustments and put a little money over here, then actually you can start to see some real traction. And then it, you know, it definitely starts to pick up and you do have this you know, virtuous flywheel mm -hmm. of goodness that starts to happen. So it's definitely not an either or, it's just where we feel we can add the most. I think you made me think of one of your colleagues uh, said something to me once about this work and the fact that it was about hitting singles yeah. and doubles and not right. always working on a home run. Right. And I yeah. do think in the healthcare industry specifically, you know, we we think that we have to solve the whole thing and really, you know, it's so complicated and connected yeah. that we have to focus on those small small right. wins right. Um, at a time. So, Sitting on the bench for a long time exactly. as we wait for that home run. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so to close us out, you know, this is just the beginning of the conversation. And, and when I think about, Allison, you all have done work with other managed care companies. If health plans around the, the country, right, could hear this today, uh, what does the future look like? And what is it that we want them to hear and how we want them to, you know, get involved? And again, it doesn't have to just be the MCOs. Maybe it's just even the industry, right? How, what can they hear from this today that you want to make sure that we, um, that we cover? Yeah. Um, so a couple of thoughts. One is, I think what's often held us back is a desire to know for sure that something is going to work and we hold ourselves to a threshold of evidence that prevents us from just doing something. Um, that is not the threshold of evidence that's required by capital markets. It's not the threshold of evidence that you and I use mm -hmm. usually. And I understand why it's there, but I think a little bit more impatience and tolerance for taking risk would be um, really, really wonderful. Um, and I'll actually hold my second one because I want to oh. see what, what Robert's going to say to this one. Robert? All right, so I'm answering the same question. Yeah, so future. just what, okay. you know, when we think about moving forward, we have a lot of work to do, right? Like the, yeah. the nice thing about these strategies, they're not one and done. The, the commitments right. that Humana's made are into the next coming years, right? We have to right. break ground on buildings before yeah. we can even put, um, put more families into bed. So if, you know, if there, is there one thing that you think about that if everyone could hear today, we're, we're hearing this one thought, uh, Allison talked a lot about, yeah. you know, capacity for just risk, which I love yeah. because I think we're, we're in an, a risk averse industry, right? right. Um, but it, you know, what comes to mind? Well, that's a good one, and I'm, I, I like how she held her second one there to to one up me at the very end. But no, just, no, just kidding, just kidding. Um, so, you know, one thing I would just kind of echo the comment on on singles versus home runs. This work is done one community at a time, one individual at a time, one family at a time, um, and we can never forget that. Uh, quite often, you know, when we love these kind of complex financing models and kind of a vision of what could happen. We lose track of the fact that there's just an intense amount of need right now within communities. And, and the more that we can kind of partner to solve those needs and kind of break down some of those barriers, I know that's kind of my word of the day mm -hmm. is barriers. Yeah. The more we can put those, those puzzles together uh, as a, a system, I think the more effective we're going to be. So that would be kind of my big idea and big takeaway is, is that idea of more of this has to happen, mm -hmm. uh, more of working between managed care, community-based providers, and you know experts in, in financing and innovative models work together to solve these issues. Um, that's gonna be the ultimately the, the key to success for us. So Allison, did he take your oh. your thought or do you no, have one no. more? No, no, and the second word for the day is puzzle. Puzzle, puzzle, way, right? like, <laughs> puzzle, puzzle and barriers, yeah. Um, no, I was gonna say like, as critically important as these programs are because of the very real need, uh, what I'd love to see if I'm dreaming big is more attention to upstream, right? Do we have to wait to mobilize capital and to have these programs uh, until a woman is um, in a horrible situation mm. where she has to choose, you know, sort of how to deal with a, a crisis of substance use and has children and all of the other things that she may be dealing with um, in her life at that point. Or is there a way for us to think about applying this framework and this financing approach to try to address and move more capital to the things that will mitigate the likelihood of people being in crisis downstream. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, ideally, maybe that's not a five year goal, maybe that's a 10 or 15 year goal, but I think um, there's an appetite and a will certainly on our part, and I'm sure on VOA's part to mm -hmm. move in that direction. Yeah, let's talk about partnership for a minute and the importance that we all play different roles in this and that together we really can you know, transform the way that healthcare happens. So Robert, starting with you, what, tell me, tell me a little bit about why partnership is important from your perspective. Well, I mean, this only gets done if we have strong partners. Uh, no one of us within the system is going to solve this. I mean, these issues are, are so large uh, that it really takes partners like Quantified Ventures, Human and Volunteers of America bringing their, their best skills and attributes 
uh, to the table and working with one another to, you know, ultimately a, a achieve this system transformation that we're talking about. Allison, what about you? What does, when we think about partnership, why is that so important? in this work? Yeah, so um, I think it's so foundational for partners to really interrogate the question of what they actually are trying to achieve. And I think why this partnership is so important and mm -hmm. meaningful for Quantified Ventures and, and for all of us is that we all want to see a different future where we're delivering services that are sorely needed and we're financing that in a different way so that organizations like VOA and others actually have the resources they need. You know, one organization can't solve this on their own and they right. shouldn't because that's how we really, um, you know, duplicate things and we make more added complexity to systems. So I just wanted to also say it's so important that, you know, we bring what we're good at, you guys bring what you're good at. Right. And, and Robert, we really enable you guys to do more mm -hmm. of the great work that you already do in communities. So yeah. thank you both for your time today. And I know we'll all see each other soon. Great. It's a thank pleasure. You. Thank Thanks. you.